Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect, and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. So good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on where you are. The uh, workshop of today is a workshop related to the problem of deforestation. We know how important is it, and we want to uh, teach you how it is possible to analyze the deforestation using machine learning and using the Google Earth Engine. So I will start sharing my screen. And before starting, I want to introduce the people who will help me in this webinar. So the first person is Vasil, Vasil Jordanov, engineer Vasil Jordanov, who is a PhD student at the Vasil Levski National Military University in Bulgaria, but is also a research fellow at the Politecnico di Milano, which is the university where I teach a GIS. But uh, so welcome Vasil. Hello, thank you. Yes, good afternoon. And then we have a lot of assistants today they are all students of the Politecnico di Milano, specifically the course of study in geoinformatics engineering. And so I am very happy to introduce Ahmed Abdelgadeh, Ahmed Eisa. Hello. Hello, hello, Ahmed. Thank you Good for afternoon. being here. Alessandro Austoni. Hi, everyone. Hello, Alessandro. Thank you. Juan Francisco Anieva. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello, Juan Francisco. Thank you for being here. And Julia Anna Leonardi. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Ahmed Omer Hamed Mukhtar. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Hi. Hello, good afternoon. And then also Nicolina Zalemi. Hello, pleasure to be here. Thank you, thank you, Nicolina. And then Martina Giovanna Esposito. Hi, hello, everyone. Hello, and last but not least, Ahmed Mohamed El Tahir Yassin. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello, thank you. Thank you also to you. So first of all, uh, the uh, students here, uh, they will be the assistants. So they will help us in answering the question in such a way that if you have questions and you are stopped and you don't know how to go ahead, you can write and they will answer, helping you in solving the problem. If uh, uh, there is no time for answering because the answer is very long, or if there is uh, something that is not essential for going ahead in the exercise of today, they will keep track of your questions and uh, we will answer to your questions in the next days. So please, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat, ask the questions, and we will reply or immediately or in the next days. 
in such a way to solve all your doubts. So thank you so much, Ahmed, Alessandro, Juan Francisco, Juliana, Ahmed, Nicolina, Martina, and Ahmed. And uh, now we leave you going in the back and answer to all the questions of our attendees. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay. And okay. on the opposite, we will start now our webinar. So first of all, this is uh, the first part of our webinar. So we have uh, this part today. And then the second part will be the 29 of March. So if uh, um, you know people missing this part, this part will be available on YouTube. And please tell them to watch it if they want to attend the second part, because it's very difficult to understand the second part if you don't uh, if you don't uh, attend, if you don't watch this first part. Uh, then what we want you to do, uh, we want you to follow us carefully uh, to try to uh, do what, or to follow what we suggest. So this webinar is conceived in this way. Before I explain you, what we want to do, and I show you on the slides what we want to do. And then I leave the word to Vasil, and Vasil will show you how to do that in Google Earth Engine. So you will see every part twice in such a way that the first part you understand what to do, and then the second in the second part you do that practically okay so don't anticipate so don't copy and paste simply what is available on the slide in such a way that following me before and the vasil later you can be enough confident to have completely understood what uh, we are explaining then for sure there are some parts that are more complicated, and we will explain you the meaning, but we can't enter into the single detail of all the functions that we are using. This is something that you will learn using the Google Earth engine. But what we can ensure you is that if you follow the webinar, in the end, you will be able of replicating what we are doing also in the other and other parts of the uh, globe. And therefore, it is really important that you follow us in such a way that then, if you want to do that in the region where you live, you can repeat exactly what we are doing, but uh, customizing it to the place what, where you live or to another place you are interested in. Okay, so let us start first of all by saying that we decided to organize this webinar in this period because uh, next week there will be the uh, International Day of Forest. So we are in between so the first, uh, the first part of the webinar is before, and the second part is just uh, after the International Day of the Forest. And so that is a good occasion for you to learn how to do that, how to uh, analyze deforestation and compute it somewhere else uh, besides the, where we computed it. Okay. So before starting, I want to give you a very short introduction to multispectral images because uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, you are confident, you are expert on that part. And so I will tell you something very quickly just for understanding what we are doing because the main ingredient we are using for studying deforestation is uh, the satellite imagery. Okay, so uh, satellite imagery and specifically we will see that uh, the two satellites we will take into account are 
the Landsat and specifically Landsat 8, uh, one of the satellites of the Landsat family, and the Sentinel and specifically Sentinel 2. Okay, so uh, what uh, uh, I mean when I say that uh, we are uh, using satellite imagery and specifically multispectral satellite imagery. Uh, I mean that we are using those photos that are taken by the sensors on the satellite and therefore the mechanism that we are using for um, those data is as a matter of fact, the light of the sun. So by using the light of the sun, uh, we are, uh, the sun is enlightening the uh, earth and uh, the uh, radius is uh, reflected, emitted by, uh, the, uh, by the, uh, the earth. And therefore what we get with the sensor is exactly that image. So the main mechanism is of exploiting the um, electromagnetic spectrum of the light. And with respect to the light, we know that we have a continuum, electromagnetic spectrum, and that this is composed by different wavelengths going from the radio wave to the gamma ray. Radio wave very, very long, the gamma ray very, very short. And we know also that, as a matter of fact, even if we have so many wavelengths, uh, our um, natural sensor, that uh, are our eyes, are able only of uh, visualizing or understanding the wavelengths that are included in this small part of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, that is the visible one. So our natural sensor is able only of capturing and interpreting the the uh, wavelengths in this small interval that is called the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, this is not uh, the same for, for instance, other animals, like for instance, you see here in a very, uh, some simple examples, like what can see a cat with these eyes, or what can see a viper with these eyes. So you see that the image obtained is different or what the, uh, an insect can see. That is a bit different with respect to us. Okay, perfect. So what, uh, what is able to do the sensor on the board of the satellite? So let us imagine that the sensor is taking the picture of this rectangle. And just for simplify, let us imagine that here we have water, which is the blue part. Here we have soil, which is represented here by the color red. And here we have a vegetation, which is represented by the color B. And you see here the satellite taking this picture on the terrain. Okay, so every material is reflecting in a different way. So if we check what is called the spectral signature of every material, we see that as a function of the uh, wavelength, these uh, reflectance, so the, uh, what is reflected by the terrain changes depending if it is water or if it is soil or if it is vegetation. Obviously, now we are considering a very basic case, very different each other. Uh, there are generally things are a bit more shadowed. Anyway, let us suppose that it is in this way. So, what uh, we are using 
I said are the uh, two um, satellites or the uh, sensors on the two satellites, the Sentinel-2 and the Landsat-8. Instead of having the possibility as our uh, eyes only to see the part related to the visible, um, visible part of the spectrum, uh, the, these two satellites have on board sensors that are able also of, uh, mm, of capturing the uh, reflectance in other parts of the spectrum. So they have uh, as our eyes, the blue, green, and red, which are in the visible part of the spectrum. But you see that they have much more possibilities also outside the part related to the visible part of the spectrum. And therefore, at this point, if we have uh, different bands that can be captured by the sensor on the board of the satellite, it means that like, for instance, the first band, for the first band, the first band, you see that the values are almost similar to each other. And the possibility of distinguishing is really related to the precision of the sensor. So the detail the sensor has with respect to the unit of measurement. Uh, but if we consider the band two, you see that the uh, spectral signature of the three elements are is very difficult. It's very different, and that happens also for the band three, where we, for instance, don't have water. Okay, fantastic. So uh, let us consider the um, what we get as a spectral signature or as a, a number here corresponding to the three different bands. And if now we build a, a system of coordinates where we put uh, as X1 what we got in the first band, X2 what we got on the band two, X3 what we got on the band three, we can see that depending on the specific typology, so depending if it is water or if it is soil or if it is vegetation, these dots representing the different points corresponding to the picture tend to be clusterized in these three clusters representing the three elements we have. And this is exactly the principle of classification that we will see and we will use for classifying our data in vegetation and not vegetation. Okay, this is a very simple introduction to multispectral images. Then the second element that we will use is Google Earth Engine. Okay, so first of all, uh, Google Earth Engine has the possibility of combining a lot of data. We will see how many data are available, but then we have the possibility of using algorithms that are already implemented to add our algorithm. And we have the possibility also of using uh, it for applications or developing new applications. Uh, Earth Engine is available for commercial use, but it remains free for, for the academy and for research use. And therefore, this is the reason why uh, we want to uh, show you how you can exploit it. Okay, so speaking about the data, uh, we have that the Earth Engine catalog, the data catalog is very, very rich. Uh, we have uh, Landsat and Sentinel data that I already mentioned, uh, which have uh, a resolution on the ground of 30, uh, 10, 30 meters. And we have data, we can say weekly, uh, then we have uh, in the catalog the MODIS data, which on the opposite have 250 meters of uh, spatial resolution, but temporal resolution of one day. 
Then we have many vector data like the world database on protected areas, as an example, the tiger database. We have data referring to the terrain or data referring to the land cover. And we have data about the weather, climate, and so on. And then besides that, we can also upload, up, uh, upload to the platform our uh, vector or raster data. So um, considering the data available, uh, we can say that there are more than 200 public data sets and that there are more than 4,000 new images uh, every day. Uh, totally more than 5 million images and uh, more than 7 petabytes of data. Uh, then, uh, how can we work in Google Earth Engine? Oh, there are two possibilities. We can work in JavaScript or Python. And today, and we will use uh, the JavaScript. Okay, so uh, uh, with respect to the um, data uh, that uh, are available, uh, we say that uh, we have many, many data. Uh, we have the possibility of uh, uh, analyzing this, those data, the data that are available, and we will do that in a moment. Uh, but besides that, there are also some um, other um, platforms that or other applications that are built directly upon Google Earth Engine. And this is an example. This is the example of the Global Forest Change developed by the University of Maryland. And you can see here the, um, the URL if you want to, uh, to check it or if you want to see it. And this is built exactly using Google Earth Engine in the back as an engine for uh, making the computations. Okay, so now we have the two main ingredients that we need. So the platform and uh, we know uh, something about the data from the theoretical point of view. Let us see uh, what we want to do in which place we want to make this computation and how we want to do that. Okay, with respect to what we want to see today, we want to study the forestation between the years 2015 and 2019. So those are the two years that uh, we are considering. Obviously you can repeat it also in other years if you are interested in other years. Then where? where we considered as a case study uh, an area here in Brazil, specifically one part of this region that is in the Pará state. And we considered it because there is a huge problem of uh, the was in the past years, uh, a huge problem of deforestation. So this is uh, the uh, macro region that we are considering. And inside of this region, we are taking these small, not so small, but <laughs> definitely small compared with all the Brazil, this small uh, region or area of interest. And this area of interest as an extension of almost 50,000 square kilometers. And as you can see from the picture, it is a region, a very rich region with respect to forest. Okay, and here you can see a, a picture showing the um, deforestation in the different years, starting from the 1990. So you see how clearly the region was deforestated. And in the second picture here on the right, you see the result of our classification. So the result where you arrive in the end of the second part of this webinar. The 
the deforestation, so the forest loss, but also the forest gain because there were some campaign for, uh, for reforesting uh, some zone. And then we will uh, compute the uh, net loss because unfortunately it is negative with respect to that, even if there are some regions that are green, uh, light green, um, in the end, the, the, um, it is not uh, balanced. So the forest loss uh, is more than the forest gain. Okay, so period 2015, 2019, and uh, how we do that. So first of all, Today, what we will see is an introduction to Google Earth Engine for the people who are not able of working with it in such a way to give you the possibility of learning at least the basics for doing and working with the Google Earth Engine. And we will start with the data preparation. Uh, next uh, next um, part, the 29th of March, we will see how to classify, meaning how to differentiate between region with forest and region without forest or pixels with forest, pixels without forest. Uh, so we will do the classification. We will evaluate our model to see the performance of our model, how good is it? And then uh, once we have computed the two classifications and assessed them, uh, we, will, uh, we will compute the forest loss and the forest gain. Uh, so today we will work on the data preparation, as I said, and therefore data preparation means, uh, this is not strictly in the order we will do, but it means uh, that we will define the area of interest. We already said uh, what is it. We create the the mask for the images, the cloud mask for the images, uh, not using the pixels containing the cloud uh, clouds. We define the two period of the analysis that are 2015-2019, but we will see in the detail which months we are considering. We will define the date to be used, and then we will apply those fil the filters uh, to the data. Okay, next time we will see the classification. That means uh, defining the training data set and then defining also testing data set. The training data set will be used for training the um, artificial intelligence model we want to use. And uh, so starting from the training data, we will uh, train the model and then um, derive the classification. Uh, once we have uh, the map of uh, classified pixels, uh, we will assess them, computing what is called the error matrix and computing some evaluation metrics, uh, specifically that they are called the overall accuracy and the kappa. And then the last step will be to uh, compute the forest loss and uh, uh, the foreign gain and uh, to compute the total and absolute areas that uh, um, are corresponding to the forest loss and uh, the foreign forest gain. Okay, so let us start with our data. As I said before, we are considering the two data set, the data set derived from the Sentinel-2 and data set derived from Landsat-8. In principle, we should have also decided of using only one satellite, but as they are slightly different characteristics, we preferred to use uh, uh, the two satellites, one for 2015, one for 2018, in such a way to show you how to work both with Sentinel and how to work with Landsat in such a way that in the end you are able of working with the two satellites. Okay, so with respect to the years, we are considering, uh, uh, as I said, 2015, 2019. So Landsat and specifically Landsat 8 is active since 2013. 
uh, it has a, a spatial resolution. So the pixel on the ground is 30 meter of uh, uh, size. And we will use the RGB, the red, green, blue band, and the near infrared band for our analysis. Uh, and we will use Landsat 8 for the year 2015. Uh, on the opposite, for the year 2019, we will use Sentinel-2. Sentinel-2 is active uh, since 2015. And the um, bands that we are using, the red, green, blue, the near infrared, have a resolution of 10 meters. So slightly is a better resolution with respect to Landsat 8. And then we will use Google Earth Engine for processing the data. Okay, with respect to the methods that we will use, we will use uh, uh, the uh, methods that uh, are already available into Google Earth Engine. And uh, specifically, we will train, as I said, uh, the artificial intelligence model, um, sampling, sampling uh, these uh, data set, the training data set, then we will uh, classify the data using one specific classifier. There are many classifier available in Google Earth Engine. Uh, they are mentioned here. They are both unsupervised and supervised classifier. Unsupervised means that we don't need the training data set, but we decided to use a, a supervised classifier and uh, Specifically, specifically among the different supervised classifiers, we verified that the best in our case was this one, RF, which is random forest. So we will use random forest, but once you have the data prepared, if you want, you can use also the other method, just check how to use them. Okay, so then uh, after the classification, we will compute the confusion matrix, and then uh, we will compute the index for interpreting the confusion matrix and deciding which is the accuracy that we get for our classification. Okay, few words about Google Earth Engine. This is the interface of Google Earth Engine, and you will see it better again with uh, Basil, because we now are entering in the practical part, the theory is behind us. And uh, um, so uh, this is the interface. We have one part that is related to the map. You see here the uh, part on the uh, bottom is related to the map. And we have the normal tools for zooming and zooming and so on. We have the tools, the geometry tools for drawing. So the normal tools that we find also as basics in the GIS. Uh, then we have a, a manager for the layer, uh, helping us in visualizing the different layer that we are overlapping to the general map of Google Earth Engine. So this is the part related to the map. And uh, on the opposite, on the top, we have uh, here one part that is more for the set setting. So here we will use it for setting our repository, the uh, folder that we use, the file that we use. Here we have all the documentation related to the different functionality functions that can be used. And uh, uh, here is uh, uh, where we can define the projects uh, we want to work with. In the center part, on the opposite, uh, we have the possibility of writing our code. And so we can write here our script or we can uh, uh, pass the script that uh, we have copied before, as uh, we will do uh, today. Um, then uh, once uh, we have written our code here, 
we can save our script uh, and uh, after having written the script, we can run it. So it's not enough of putting the script here, but if we want it to be executed, we have to run it. And then we will see the result on the map or here in this other part where we have the console. So if there are the results are maps, we will see here in the map part. If the results are text or numbers or things like that, we will see here on the opposite in the console. Okay. Then here we have uh, one button that helps us in, in the inspection of location, the pixel values, uh, all the objects that uh, we find uh, in uh, the map. And uh, then we have the last one here is the task manager. Okay, just for concluding, the other part that is uh, important is this one, this search for data on the top of uh, this part of the code editor, because uh, we will click here for searching for the data. Then this is the, uh, this is the link to the uh, Google Earth Engine, specifically that part of the part where you can write the code. And I hope that you already have uh, an account in such a way that you can start working on it. Okay, for working on it, first of all, we need the data. And for assessing the data, one possibility is to assess data through this web page. Uh, this is the uh, link that, that you have on the slides. Or another possibility is to go there, uh, where I showed you before, here, search for data. So we go there and going there, we can browse the data catalog. Okay, so, so if we select browsing the data catalog, we start seeing some data, like you see surface temperature, climate, Lancet, Sentinel. So if we select the Sentinel data, at this point, clicking on the Sentinel, we have the detail of the different sentinels because there are um, different typologies of sentinels. So now I don't have time to, for explaining, but today we are interested in Sentinel-2, the multispectral satellite. So selecting this one, at this point, uh, there is a, a new web page opening and that this new web page has a lot of pieces of information about the uh, Sentinel-2. Um, specifically, we have this uh, piece of code helping us in uh, using the collection of data uh, of the Sentinel-2 uh, Sentinel satellite. And uh, we have, also, we have also this piece of code, Explore in Earth Engine is the title. So this is a piece of code helping us in visualizing the Sentinel-2 data. Uh, don't, don't copy it now because we will see um, in a moment with uh, Buzz in this part, but you can go, you, you see that then we, we go to the Sentinel page and we have this part, which is a JavaScript code that we will use in the Google Earth Engine for visualizing the data. So at this point, I leave the word to Basil in such a way to show how to do that. Okay. Um... My screen should be shared by now, I believe, yes. Yes, it is. Okay, okay. so I would start a little bit backwards for, from a few slides backwards to start from the final uh, first uh, page of Google, uh, Google Earth Engine landing page. So I hope that everyone that uh, is wishing to follow us today 
uh, with the coding and the practice has already signed up and uh, has the active account. If not, uh, you can start uh, from the page, which is uh, earthenginegoogle.com and to sign yourself up uh, from the button here up to the right. Once it is approved and um, validated, you can start exploring the platform and everything that is related to it. Um, you can go to the code editor either from the link that is from the slides or from here you can select platform and go to the code editor. So now we'll go to the code editor and we'll explore together what is it inside actually. As you can see, it loaded again and from the slides you already understood that uh, more or less the uh, platform is separated into main uh, elements. One is the map where you eventually will see your results and your maps, also the data that you loaded. And the upper part is more related to the code that actually would be uh, needed to obtain your results and uh, to do your analysis. Um, the code part is the main code uh, section that is in the middle, while on the left and on the right there are two additional panels that are uh, helpful in different ways. Uh, we can see that on the left panel there is the script, script tab. Uh, this is the tab where most probably you have mainly your own scripts that are in the folder owner. And you can see I already have different. Usually the paths to your um, scripts are related to users and then your username that you have implemented. Anyway, you can also people share, and we can see this later on, uh, your repos repositories, you can share it or they can share it with you and they will appear here. You can have, uh, you can explore also the examples folder where already have, are pre-built and implemented different uh, codes and scripts with different uh, tasks. Uh, the second part is the docs tab, which I can uh, say that it's quite important and uh, quite useful because here is the documentation of all av available functionalities that you can use. So whenever you have a doubt uh, what you can use uh, for an image or uh, if, if there is this function, you can always come here, search into the filter, into the search box for if you know its name or you assume. You can open some and uh, read what is it about, uh, what does it need as an input, and uh, what can be as an output as well. The third tab here on the left is related to the assets. Uh, everyone that uh, goes and registers themselves to the Google Earth Engine receives uh, some allocated space that is uh, 250 gigabytes of use. You can uh, change it, at least mine is this much, and it's already uh, less than 50%. And uh, which here you can upload your own data or you can actually export your results from the your analysis uh, here into your personal asset. Of course, when there is some your information or data in your asset, you can then share it with other people that can use it or uh, can further modify. Okay, um, we'll move now to the right side panel, which is uh, hosting the inspector console and the task tab. We'll start with the console because it's the other uh, main tab that is going to be mostly used. Mainly here you see your results that are not related to some images or maps. Images and maps will go below into the, will be uh, published to the lower part, to the map canvas, while in the console here you can obtain some numerical results or some plots or graphs. And uh, for this, we will see how to do it. You have to specify print, so you want to see, if you want to see it here in the console. The other tab that is related is uh, the inspector. And with the inspector, you can go to the map layer and inspect, inspect pixel location by location what you have there. For example, now if I click here, I'll get uh, the result. As a result are the coordinates and the zoom level and at the scale that I'm looking at this map. This inspector will show you uh, the information for each layer that you have added, 
you will see more in the time when we have added more layers that it will, for one point, it will give the information for all layers. And you, if you want to expect pixel by pixel. The last tab is the tasks, which is uh, related mainly to the tasks related to export or import to Earth Engine. We will see later, most probably in the next session, but uh, as I said, uh, as we said, you can import your own data here in Earth Engine, and also you can export uh, your results. The the rest of the buttons that are left here on the main page are get link. So when you have once your script, uh, you can get link and share it with uh, whoever you want uh, of course you can disable the auto run the auto run means that when the the user that you shared it the link when he loads the link it will be automatically run whatever a program or script you shared it so if you disable it nothing will happen of course if you also don't want to share your code panel you can uh, hide it as well uh, when you write something in your script, you can save it. We will see the whole saving procedure a bit in, uh, later. So when you put also your script, you run it from the button run and you can reset your whole script. From the apps button, uh, you can move to the section that is for creating for applications, but uh, it's something when you have a final product and you want to produce. Here are the settings that are just uh, basic ones for uh, auto completion and underlining some suggestions. Okay, so I think we can go to the data catalog that uh, the other option is to, one option is to check it from here, data sets, or, or the other one is from the search box, just when you click on the Earth Engine search catalog, you click Browse Data Catalog and it opens again the same page. This is the page that you already saw in the slides. If you scroll down, you can see that um, some of the data sets are already separated thematically and uh, or according to the imagery, in this case, there are like uh, the two of the data sets that uh, let's say are most used to Landsat and Sentinel and that we are going to use uh, all together today. So let's click on the Sentinel um, and explore more into details about the Sentinel collections. You see that uh, in the Sentinel collection is not just the, the Sentinel 2, but it's also hosting uh, the data of uh, Sentinel 1, which is a, a radar mission, Sentinel 3, and Sentinel 5. But today we will focus on uh, Sentinel 2. So let's select also Sentinel 2. You can see that now we entered into another subsection of the Sentinel collection. And uh, we would prefer and to use the surface reflection. These are the differences of the post processing of the data sets. So it would be better to use surface reflectance. So let's select it. What we can explore here, probably if I can zoom a bit, will be more readable. Okay. So firstly, you see the naming convention and the level of post-processing of the data set. You can see the data availability. So it started distributing information in images from 2017. The last one that it was updated was uh, basically yesterday. You can see that the data set provider is the European Union, the European Space Agency, and the Copernicus. And this is the Earth Engine snippet that we would later use into our code editor so we can um, use the data set and call it. You can inspect the description that is a little bit more narrative about the band set, uh, about the data set. We can go and explore the bands that are available. So we have all the bands that were mentioned before into the slides and uh, with the information related about the wavelength and the spatial resolution of each uh, band. We can also go and explore the image properties. 
that uh, each image has. As you can see, there are quite a lot. Let's say, as for now, as for the beginning, one of the most one and the most used that we, we can focus is the cloudy pixel percentage, which will actually show us um, the percentage of probability of pixels that are covering, covering our image. So, because uh, image, uh, because clouds will cover our uh, image and our information, so we, we would like to use images with low pixel percentage and uh, okay this is for sentinel but uh, this is relevant to all data sets that are available on third engine at the bottom of the page if we go we will see the code snippet that we saw before that uh, it's actually uh, kind of ready so we can just go and copy it from the button copy code sample so if you want to follow, please copy the copy, uh, copy the code. Uh, and uh, we can go to our code editor. From these uh, panels, we can modify their size. We can paste it. And now we have the code that was in the uh, data catalog suggested. So I took this piece of code and I post it into our new script. So if you want to visualize it, let's just hit run and we'll see what will happen. Okay, I can make it a little bit smaller. You can see now that uh, the layers button appeared so we can see our new image that we loaded as a new layer which we can turn on and off. But most importantly is that we see an image of uh, Sentinel-2 image is projected. If you want, we can explore a bit. Um, for example, as we're located in Milano, let's search from the search box the location that we want. You can do it for your countries. So I'll do it for Milano. And now we'll see that Google Earth Engine is loading an image of Sentinel-2 above Milano. We can even zoom out. So just to explain you, this is a composite image of uh, Sentinel-2 for uh, the month of January 2020. You can see the city of Milan in Italy. You can see the Alps that are snow covered. Okay, we will go more into details of the code later on. So if you want to inspect a bit for your countries, if you want, we can put Italy. And, okay. okay, so I think we can proceed with the slides. Okay, so Thank you, Vasil, and uh, I hope you were able of following Vasil in uh, this first part. So let us start working now that we have understood how to work with the interface. So first of all, we can um, start setting up the, uh, a new workspace. And therefore, we can create a repository. This repository will be created, will be a JIT or Git repository. And uh, so you see, for instance, in this case, the user is uh, Basil Jordanov and uh, he created uh, the repository workshops. Then uh, inside the repository, the, the repository is something that you find uh, here where there is the button scripts and there is this new appearing and you see that there, there are three possibilities, repository, folder and file. So definition of the repository and then you can define the specific uh, folder like for instance the specific folder can be the repository can be the general workshops where we put all the workshops and 
specifically the folder we are considering now is the folder deforestation. And then we can define a name for the script that we are creating. So the file, so the script calling it, for instance, part one. Okay, so uh, once we have defined our workspace, uh, we can also um, at this point, once we have uh, written our script or copied our script, we can save it. There is the button here uh, for saving the script that Basil already showed and close to the, the button of, for running the script itself. And then if you want, you can also obtain the URL for your script using the get link. So if you want to save the script for sharing with somebody else, you can get the link using this button. At this point, you have the uh, link of your script that can be shared. The other thing that we can do is to upload our own data. We saw how to use some data into the um, Google Earth Engine uh, platform, but we said that we can also upload our own data. And for uploading our own data, uh, we go to the uh, asset and we select the uh, new here. And then we see that there are all the possibilities like image upload or table upload like shapefile or CSV or image collection folder and so on. Uh, so in case we want to upload an image, we will select this GeoTIFF or TFR record uh, for uploading, and then these, uh, there is this uh, um, menu appearing, and we can upload in this way. Or if we are interested in, uh, in uploading a vector file, like for instance, the shape file, a shape file, uh, we will select this one, and then at this point, uploading a new shape file. And we will see how to do that using as a vector file, the shape file defining the region of interest. So if you click on the, um, on the slide, there is this uh, Amazon region of interest, which is the region where we want to compute the deforestation. And if you click on it, you will download it and then we will reuse it for uploading into the, um, the uh, Google Earth Engine. So at this point, again, I leave the word to Vasil, who will show you how to do that. Okay, in the meantime, I started a new session just to start clean and to see one by one all the things now practically. So the first thing that we will create is the repository. So as you see, we will go to the tabs called scripts and we will press on the red button new. And from there we will select the repository. You see by default is the part that I already showed you that is related to the user, your personal username that you have input. And now you can create a folder, uh, the repository. So you can put whatever your name you want to be. Uh, in the slides, it was a uh, workshop. So let's create workshops. And then you hit create. I will not create it because I already have it inside. So if I open my owner menu, you see that on the bottom of my list, I have a user's workshop workshops okay the next step now if you want you can directly go to create a script or if you want to create additional folder as in this case i have the station we can go back to the button new select and create a new folder you can select the repository that you have already created so 
in this case it is workshops if you want i will go again new folder you select from the list the repository that you have just created workshops and you put the name in this case deforestation or if you want another name you can put it and you click ok so the folder will be created i will not do it again because i have it but i will create a new script with you we we'll go to button new file we select again the repository that we want workshops here it is important that if you want to put the script into the folder that you have just created, you cannot manually, uh, you cannot select it from a list as it was, as it is with the repository. So it is important that you write the folder, the forestation slash and the name of the script that you want. So I can do test script, let's say. So just to repeat again, if you want the script to be inside the folder, you have to manually type the name of the folder followed by a slash. So the script will appear there. You can cl click clean, uh, okay? And the script appears into the folder. You click inside and you are already into the script. Okay. If you opened directly a new uh, code ed editor and if you didn't save initially your script and it is written like this new script and it has a star, by the way, the star means that it's not saved. So it's good to do it sometime. So you go to the button save, save us, and you select again the repository that you want to work in and this time i will not save it in the deforestation folder just to show you so i'll do it as again test script script okay now if i go to my own repository you see that the test script is out of the forest the, the folder deforestation let's say that i want to share the script with someone so to do that i have to do it through the get link button on the top of the code editor get link and you obtain a link that you can share the code interestingly if you don't hide the code the code will be visible to the people that you shared it with they cannot if, if they change it, the change will not appear in your personal script. But if you change the script, it will appear to them each time when it is saved. So you can save an initial version of your code, share it with your collaborators, for example. And each time you add something new and you save it, it will appear to them. Okay. Um, this was about the script. Now let's see how to add a new uh, additional external data set to your own uh, repository, to your assets. We go to the assets button new and depending on the file type that you want to upload, you can do it use, if you want to up upload some raster image, you should do it in the GIF, in the T format, you select the image. You can select the source file from where you, you want. You can just drag it. You can put it again in some specific asset ID or a folder. It is the same principle as uh, I showed you with the scripts. You can set it. Okay. You can put some additional method, metadata and you hit upload. We can do that together. If you download it from the slides, the Amazon Roy.zip. Let's do it together. So we go again to the assets, new. In this case, we would like to upload a table in the shape. So it is a shape file. 
but you know the shape file has uh, different uh, small files you, you either can upload each one of them or you can archive them in a zip and upload the whole zip directly to the google earth engine so let's do it i'm dragging and dropping and you see that the asset name was automatically filled if you want to add some property or uh, some additional information you can do it uh, then you hit the button upload i'll change the name because i already have the same name test upload and it disappeared now you can see that actually my tasks button uh, blinked in orange if we go and see there we will see that there is an ongoing task that is uploading uh the file that i have just selected so it may take some time you can see that it's giving less than a minute because it's a relatively small file but it can take some time for bigger files when the task is ready it will change the icon with a confirmation tick so you know that it's ready it is good to refresh the asset uh, tab by the button reset and then you can go and search for your file we have just uploaded amazon roy so let's click on it and you can see what you can see is a small preview of the location of the file that you just uploaded a small preview of what actually it looks like but in this case is a relatively square format so that's why it looks like this and you have a table id this table id is the path to your asset that you can further use by yourself or you can actually share it with someone else in the description tab you can see some description if we have added and uh, it is the same for the features you can see that we have just one feature now and we can see some properties if we have added but for now we don't okay uh you to share the asset with someone external except just providing the table id the path here we have to go and click to the share button and then say done otherwise still the uh, asset will not be anyone can read Okay, I don't want to share it again. Okay, otherwise it is not shared uh, completely with the people. Okay, I think for now this is from me. Okay, so thank you, Basil. Uh, let's go a bit ahead. So now we have set up our uh, project and uh, what we need to do is to see some just a very brief introduction to javascript in such a way to understand what we will add later to the script so uh, very quickly some basic instructions so that uh, you will see again later with Basil. So please pay attention. You see this first line. First of all, we see this uh, double backslash. Double backslash means that this line of code is commented. So every time we want to comment it, not to be run, we put this double backslash and uh, what we want to do in this case is to print this uh, uh, sentence. So print means that then in the console, I will see exactly what I'm putting here. So print then uh, opening the, uh, with the mark here, hello world, this is a GIS workshop, closing and semicolon. So you see that here is printed hello world, this is a GIS workshop. Okay, 
if uh, we have uh, a multi line that we want to comment, instead of using always the double backslash in the beginning of every line, we can use slash and then star in the beginning, star and slash in the end. A way for commenting very quickly some lines that you have already written is to select them. And then if you are using an English keyboard, because if your keyboard is not English, you have to see depending of uh, the uh, keyboard, which is uh, the, um, which are the, um, the uh, button that you have to consider. But if it is an English keyboard, you have to uh, press Ctrl plus slash and automatically all the lines will be added the uh, two backslash. Okay. Uh, if I want to declare a variable, uh, I use this bar, then I give the number to the variable. And so if uh, then I want to see the variable that I declared, I can write print what my number is, for instance, and the variable itself. You see the same name as the variable before. But we didn't give right now a value to this my number. And therefore, we will see in the console my number is, but we don't have the value. So it is undefined. Uh, on the opposite, if we want to declare the variable, but we want to initialize it, so to give a value to our variable, we will put a bar my number, for instance, this is the name that I decided to give to my variable, equal to five. So if I print later these, I see that my number is, and this is equal to five because I gave my variable the value equal to five. Okay, um, so uh, we saw that uh, there is the possibility of having a number as a variable that uh, we can have also string as variable, like for instance, uh, this variable is, uh, can be a number, this is pi, this variable is a string that I define in this way. Uh, we can define also a more complex structures uh, like for instance, an array. And so you see that uh, an array is a combination of more elements. They can be numbers, for instance, or they can be string array. So we can, we can have both. And if I want to print it, I can print my string. And so I will have all these value, or I can print just one component of the array. And with respect to that, the first one corresponds to the number zero, the second one corresponds to the number one, and the third one corresponds to the number two. So this is zero, position zero, position one, position two. So if I write print my string array zero, what I get in the console is red. And Obviously, I have nothing here because you see that I didn't put print my first element is. I simply said print just my string array here. So print just this element. Okay. If you want to print the first number, you have to write print my number array zero. Okay. Then there is the possibility of defining also uh, more complex objects uh, that are called objects or dictionary. And uh, they are composed by pairs of uh, keys and variables. So this is the example. I define uh, this dictionary that I call my dictionary. And it is composed by these three elements. This is the first element, the element name. 
then I have the element year and I have the element task. So if I want to print it, I obtain, you see, the complete object. If I decide to print my dictionary only the name, I obtain the first one, that one. If I decide to print my dictionary year, I obtain this one, so the second one. And you see that in this case, it is composed by two elements like that one. And therefore, if I define print my dictionary task one, it means that I want to print the second one. And in fact, here in the console, the GEE -E will appear. Okay, so now that we have seen that one, let us go to something that is a bit more complex. And let us see a new element that is the function. What is a function? A function is something that I want to apply recursively on a list of something. Let us see an example. Uh, suppose that I'm defining a, a, um, a new variable that is a list of number from one to for doing that, I'm using this element of Google Earth Engine. So that one means that I'm creating a list of numbers from 1 to 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, arriving to 10. If I print my list, at this point, I print this list of the 10 numbers. Okay. Uh, then the second point is that I want to apply a function to all these numbers. So the specific function that I want to apply now is to make the square of all the numbers in the list. So I'm defining a new variable, which is a function. And this function takes the number that is in the list and uh, uh, create and do that uh, power it to twice. Okay, the number power twice. twice. Okay, so once I have defined this one, I can obtain as a result of applying this function, uh, I can call it compute squares. Okay. And at this point, I apply it to the list of my numbers before, and I obtain a new list with the squared number. That's it then at this point I can print this list and see the result of my list. Okay. So this is the way of creating new functions. Please pay attention that some functions have to be created, but many functions are already available and we can simply reuse it. If we want to have more pieces of information about JavaScript, there are some links in this page. And so if you want simply to repeat this exercise simply in another region or corresponding to another year and so on, you can do that easily by interpreting what is written in the script. But uh, if you want to do something that is more complicated, more elaborated, you need to learn how to write code using the JavaScript. And therefore, I suggest you to go to this website and learn how to work with it. Okay, so um, we were speaking before about uh, um, some... Uh, uh, object classes or elements that we have already available in uh, Google Earth Engine. And I want just to mention uh, the um, 
what are the most used in our case, in case we are dealing with uh, um, the images for doing something like, for instance, we are, will do uh, classification of images. Okay, so uh, the uh, e dot image, uh, you, you find all the description uh, where uh, near to the scripts, uh, there is this other menu, which is the docs. Uh, and you find here all of these uh, uh, object classes and their description. Clicking on them, you find all the description. Um, so uh, what we are using is EE image, that is an image, E image collection, that is a stack or time series of images, E geometry, that is uh, an object to represent a vector, E feature, that is a geometry with attributes, so not only the geometry, but also the attributes, a feature collection, which is a, a set of features, and then another another um, object class that we will use is E reducer. Uh, this reducer is a way to aggregate data. This aggregation of data can be done uh, over time, over space, over bands, array, arrays, and also other structures. Like, for instance. If we consider reduce bands, it means that, for instance, we are computing something for every band, for the, for the pixel corresponding to every band. If we are reducing with respect to the neighborhood, the result of our function will be to consider the pixels around the pixel where we are computing, or if we consider with respect to the time, suppose that we have images partially overlapping corresponding to different time, if we want to compute the mean or the median, it means that we will consider the stack of partially overlapping images for computing the final, the uh, result um, of the reduced image. Okay, then at this point, just to try by yourself, I suggest to work a bit with Vasil and see how it is possible to compute the median. Basil, we don't hear you. Basil, I don't know if you are speaking, but I can't Sorry, yes, hear you. It was, it was blocked and I couldn't. Uh, OK, I think now you should hear. Yes, now it is okay. working. Sorry, perfectly. OK. Anyway, um, I was just saying that uh, I'll start again with a very brief introduction to JavaScript, uh, copying and pasting from the slides just very briefly. And I want to show the difference. This is the first line that is commented, so it means that it will not be executed. It, the code, the JavaScript will not understand it as a code and it will not run it. While the second line that is print will actually print, as I said, will send it to the console. So it will send this string, this is the set of char characters to the console. So let's see what will happen if we put run. We will see that the text that we put here, we it is in the console now. So with print, we always send results to the console. Well, we will see later how to send the results to the map itself. Okay, uh, just quickly to go to the rest of the examples that we gave. In the first one, let's move it. 
if we just declared our variable my number without defining a, a, anything with it and we try to print it to the console we will see that it's giving undefined because we didn't say what is it actually is it a number or it is a string so in this case let's see put a number five and now when we print it again it appears my number is five okay so let's continue uh the same is with the if we do uh strings so if we copy and paste strings the chain of characters and in this uh, case we wrote hello gs the strings should be always in quotation marks closed so it means that you should have in the beginning and in the end quotation mark um, it doesn't matter if it's going to be double quotation or single quotation but they should not be mixed in the sense that if you start your string with quota double quotation it should finish with double quotation if we run it it will nothing will happen actually because we didn't put it uh, to print so let's put it quickly print my string and let's run it again okay hello just i want also to show you the part with the arrays i copied and pasted from the slides so if we run again the whole piece of code we will see that now we have uh, the first element so when we start counting in the list in this case that we printed my string here i just made a little bit space in this case we printed my string so it has three elements but the counting starts zero one two so we don't have three if you want to print the third element you should put in the bracket uh, third two so you see now it is printed blue you can see that if you just print dictionary as we did in this case you can explore it manually and all the variables that we have defined inside whether they're with numbers or strings you can see them but if you want to give them and to call them separately you can use one of those options and uh, let's do the last part with the um, definition of a function so firstly i put to generate a list of sequence from one to ten so if we print it we will see that it's generating a list with all the numbers from one to ten then if we define the function okay um we define the function that is called uh, uh compute squares and we say that it's function and the input should be a number what the function will return is again number but the number that we input on the power of two so if we print now the new if we first apply so in the first line we apply the function to the list that we have previously defined we apply the new function that we created and we print the new squares and we run it you see now we got everything on the power of two and to see the reducer i would go back to the script that we created before the test script okay i don't want to save the changes now so yes i'll abandon the script that i showed you with the sentinel 2 images let's run it ah, okay it's not in italy if you see here we're defining we're calling our image collection and in the end actually we are applying a reducer i'll go more into general procedure in the uh, in a bit but just for, to show you the reducer we have we are applying a mean reducer um, to apply a median we just go we have to go to the uh, documentation and search for a median to see how it is we are working now with an image collection and we have an image collection median function so we can see that this is the function that we need so just to repeat we go to the docs 
we know the function that we want to use and we search for it. So instead of mean, this time we can see median and we run again the code. Okay. Um, I think uh, I think yes. We can proceed again with the slides. Okay. So thank you, Vasil, and uh, let's go ahead with our slides. Meanwhile, I was told that there are some links to this source of JavaScript that are not working. So Vasil, if you can check it. Okay. So uh, now we go, now that we are expert in JavaScript, uh, we can uh, start our exercise. So first of all, what we want to do, we want to, when we enter Google Earth Engine to uh, be located in the region, in our region of interest. For doing that, we define uh, a region of interest. Um, there are more possibilities. Uh, one possibility is uh, to define this region, simply defining a point. So in this case, I can pick one point that is in the center with respect to our area of interest. And I can define this point. It's a new variable. I call this variable point Brazil. You can call it as you please, obviously. And this is a geometry, a EE geometry. We saw before that E geometry means that it's a vector data and specifically it is a point. So when I use E geometry point, I'm expecting to have the coordinates. And here we are putting the coordinates in WGS84. Okay, so once we have defined these uh, um, variable, the variable point, we can center our map with respect to this point. And for doing that, we use this map with capital M center object, and we center it with respect to this point, this variable, which is point Brazil. And this is the scale. So how many times we want to zoom in and zoom out. So you can uh, see that by changing this number, you zoom or unzoom with respect of the region around the point, around, around this point that will be in the center of your map. Okay, so this is the way for centering, one possibility for centering my map. And if, I want also to visualize or not visualize this point, I can also add a, um, a, a legend for this layer in such a way to see also this new layer that is, that can be called for instance, center of the region. And we know that it is a point, okay. So that is a, a first possibility for, um, for locating ourselves in the region we are interested in. Uh, the second possibility is to use directly the area of interest, the region of interest that we used before. So in this case, we define uh, this new uh, variable and we call it A or I. Obviously, also in this case, we can call as we please. And uh, it, is, uh, this, it is a feature collection and uh, corresponding to the region of interest that was uh, before shared by Basil. Okay, so we uh, center our map with respect to this area of interest. Again, the zoom level that we are considering is nine. And we add this legend 
with putting as a name of the layer area of interest. Okay, the last thing that we want to do now is to compute how large is the area of interest because we gave you before some numbers, but in principle, you don't know. It is possible to do that. And therefore we compute the area of our region of interest. And for doing that, we use this function where we need to divide by this number because everything is in meters. And therefore, if we want to have it in square kilometers, we need to divide by 1 million. And then once we have computed it, we want also to uh, print the area. So we print this uh, part, area of interest area, and the number corresponding to this variable. And again, the last part where we put the measurement unit. Okay, then let's go ahead at this point, uh, um, considering uh, the first image that uh, we want to create. The first image that we want to consider is uh, um, um, an image that we obtain obtained from uh, uh, Landsat 8. We said that we consider Landsat 8 in the year 2015. And specifically, as we uh, want to see the vegetation, um, we decided to use the, the images in the summer period. So from the beginning of uh, uh, May to the end of August. So you see that we consider an image collection. This is something that we already saw before with respect to Land um, Sentinel before. In this case, it is Landsat. We filter with respect to the data. Uh, we filter with respect to the region of interest. So it means uh, considering the images uh, uh, partially covering or covering totally the area of interest. Uh, we filter also with respect to the cloud cover. So this is another, um, another object help, another class helping us in filtering with respect to the cloud coverage. So in this case, it means that we are accepting at most 10% of the cloud cover. And uh, uh, then at this point, we take all the images in this period, and we apply the media. Uh, in the end, we clip our images with respect of the area of interest, so limited to our area of interest. Okay, uh, here there is uh, one more function that we are applying. So it means that uh, this function as always for the function has to be put in the beginning of our script in such a way that then it is, we are sure that is applied every time it is found. And it is a, a, a way for, um, it is a, a normal processing of Landsat data. So every time we are using Landsat images, we are applying these uh, scaling factors. So we define in the beginning of our script this function, which is a standard one, and then we apply this function to every uh, Landsat 8 image. Okay, so now we have uh, our uh, image as a combination of all the Landsat uh, eight images of 2015 in that period in our region with cloud cover less than 10% and scaled with respect to this factor, the median of uh, the pixels, and we, we want to visualize it. So we define how to, to visualize it and specifically the bands that we consider, uh, putting here minimum and maximum. Also, these ones are 
enough standard. And uh, um, then at this point, uh, once we have defined uh, this standard parameter for visualization, uh, we add this layer to our map, uh, which is the Landsat uh, 2015 uh, map, the ones that we computed, starting from all those images and filtering them. Okay, so this is what appears. And uh, this is one possibility for the visualization of our image. We can also decide to visualize the data in another way. So that is uh, visualized in true color, but we can also decide of visualizing uh, using other colors. Like for instance, one possibility is uh, to use uh, a false color changing the um, bands that uh, we are considering. In this case, uh, we are using the near infrared bands, the re red and the green, instead of the uh, red, green, and blue. Uh, in this way, we have the possibility of uh, visualizing the vegetation, which is red, because uh, the trees uh, uh, with the more chlorophyll, uh, they are reflecting uh, more near infrared energy than, uh, than the uh, trees uh, that are not uh, health. And therefore, in this case, uh, we see the vegetation, we see the, the vegetation, the health vegetation in uh, light, in, uh, in uh, strong red. Okay, so this is another possibility for visualizing our data, but uh, we can do something more because uh, we know that it is possible also to play with combination of bands. And uh, one possibility is uh, to consider uh, a new mm, synthetic band uh, or a new synthetic value which is a combination of uh, near infrared and red band. And uh, this is called the NDVI, so the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And specifically, uh, if uh, we uh, create uh, this uh, new, uh, new band, uh, we have that uh, every time uh, we have a negative value of the NDVI, uh, these uh, correspond to water. If we have a value close to zero, this correspond generally to uh, bar earth, rock, sand, or snow. If we have a, a low positive value, they are shrubland and grassland. And on the opposite value approaching, uh, approaching one, they are uh, really forced. If we want to have more pieces of information about that, uh, we can check here where there is detailed explanation about how to do that. Okay, so uh, uh, for um, computing these NDVI, uh, we can use uh, uh, several uh, uh, methods. Uh, the first one is uh, simply to compute it manually. So uh, we have uh, the near infrared band, which is this one, the red band, that is that one. And then we compute the new variable doing near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red, and we call it NDVI. And at this point, we visualize the uh, NDVI uh, variable that uh, we defined. Another possibility is to uh, use uh, one functionality that is already provided, uh, one function that is already provided in Google Earth Engine. So at this point, it's easier. We don't need to make our computation. It's enough of using the functionality that is this one, and then we can visualize it exactly as uh, we did before. 
Uh, another possibility again is uh, to create our own functionality doing exa exactly that. So, and this is uh, what is uh, um, the third case where we want to show you how to create the functionality. So Basil will show you how to create functionality. And once we have created it, we shall remember to put the functionality in the beginning of our script, and then we will visualize the uh, new layer exactly as we did before. So if we consider the third uh, option, at this point, uh, we have uh, to uh, put our function before uh, defining our variable. And then we have to apply this map to the function that we have defined before. And you see that here we have the Lancet 2015. And uh, uh, you see that. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, our uh, layer defined, and then we want to visualize it putting this name. Okay, so I believe that now it's time to, for, for you to working. So I leave uh, the screen to Vasil. Okay, so we'll start again back from the definition of the point of the center so i take it from the script and what we will do here is to define our point for, uh, firstly so we are defining a geometry of the point with those coordinates that we have predefined before uh we know that the coordinates are in uh, wgs 84 coordinates and then to actually center the map because let me just and to comment it so it's not going to be work just to show you so if we put the variable nothing will happen if i run it even though that we have coordinates we can print it so it can come to the console but the map will not uh, change so for that we have to say that the map should be centered around the object okay in this case to the point of brazil at the zoom level of nine and when we run it, we see that our map is actually now above our area, the point that we put, but we don't see the point. And this is because we didn't add the layer to the map. So we add the layer with map, add the layer, the variable name of the, the, the layer that we want to add. In the parentheses here, we should put, if we, we want some visualization parameters or not, we leave it empty. And then in the quotation marks, we add the name of the layer. So if we run it, we will see now that it's loading the center of region as we define it. And here is our point on the map. But it, in our case, it's more convenient to work with a polygon. So let's use the polygon that we have defined before that we have uploaded. So for any case, I don't know if you managed to already upload from the tasks, but if not, uh, you can use the polygon that I have already shared and we'll define it as a new variable called area of interest, AOI, which is a feature collection and we are providing the path it. We are centering the object around it and we are adding it as a layer called area of interest. In the meantime, we will compute our uh, uh, its area and for it, it will extract the geometry function, we will extract the geometry of the feature collection, compute its area in uh, square meters and for that we will divide, divide to convert it in square kilometers. And in the end, we will I print it to the console, the final result. And also you can see that actually here we're combining strings and variables as a print to the console. So let's see what will happen if we run it. Okay. We have our area of interest, which is almost 48 and 500 square uh, thousand square kilometers. 
Uh, what I wanted to show you is the difference into the zoom levels that here I put nine and you may ask why nine uh, because in this there is no particular reason but uh, let's say in our case it's good uh, because if we put let's say two you can see we see the whole world more or less twice and a half we can put uh, five and we're still really far from our area so by now let's say we can use nine okay let's continue with the other part the next slide was related with the Landsat uh, definition of image the first part of it was the function that is apply scale factor that uh, as we said it's good to stay on top or almost on top when you are defining function of your script so whenever you decide to use it you know that it's already defined because if i have want to use it let's say here it will not work because the function is created is defined after the call that i'm calling it so it would be impossible so better when you have those functions to keep them at more at possible the topest part of your script so let's take the definition of landsat 2015 and let's see what is happening here. So here we have Lancet 2015 is the name of the variable that we're defining. And we use the image collection of Lancet 8 as we took the code snippet from the data catalog. We are filtering uh, by date. So we are saying filter our uh, Lancet collection from 2015 May. So the denomination is year month day keep that in mind and uh, so we want all the images that are from 1st of may till 30th of august 2015 to be just considered why we choose those dates uh, because uh, of the tropicals there is uh, quite a lot of uh, cloud cover and uh, let's say in this period uh, there are less in the dry season Okay, on the next uh, uh, layer, the next filter, we are the filtering the bounds according to our area of interest. So we want all the images because till now we have all the images on the global collection according to those dates, but we want us to filter them specially. So for that, we're using also filter bounds according to our area of interest. So only images that are covering fully or partially our area of interest polygon will be considered what we are doing after that we are applying additional filter that is related to the uh, property cloud cover and we are saying that to add a filter which has a filter where the cloud cover is lower than 10 percent so we want also the images that are having 10% uh, having cloud cover to be considered. So in the meantime, we are uh, still, we are printing a site, means that we'll still print to the console uh, the image collection. It will print, of course, the information about the image collection. And after that, we will map the function apply scale, fact, scale factors that we defined before and it will be followed by uh, applying a median reducer for all the images that are in the collection and then because from this point on we are not dealing anymore with an image collection but from all the images in the image collections from till here we are creating one image the median with the median values of all of them so after that we can actually clip it according to the boundaries that we have defined okay uh, the visualization parameters we can define them as well <coughs> visualization parameters we are defining a dictionary with uh, the visualization parameters and we we are defining uh, property with bands and we're using just the red blue and a green band with those values let's run okay now we, we can only see actually that uh, the print and we can see the image collection uh, information that 
it contains 18 elements so it means that we have for this period 2015 for our area of interest with our condition for the cloud car we have on, only 18 images that are suitable and will be considered so from 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 those 18 images we have collected and produced only one image that we can visualize using sending it to the layer and it will be uh, we're sending Landsat 2015 to the map with the visual visualization parameters we have defined with this name Landsat 2015 let's see it And you can see that actually the order of appearance of the layers are according to how you define them. So firstly, it was uh, um, added to the layer the area of interest. We can turn it off. And now we have our image of Lanza 2015. We can actually inspect some properties here. So if you go to layers, the layer that you're interested in into the settings, and we can see which bands we're using. So those are defined in our visualization parameters, the values. And you can change them if you want. So you saw how it can be done through the code. In this case, I want to change it no, to let's see to four three, four and three with a value of five. So we can have the false false color near infrared. Uh, Yes, visualization that highlights the vegetation in red. Whatever is not uh, vegetation, it's in darker colors. You can inspect. I can go again uh, a bit slowly to show you. So we go to the layers, the name of the layer and the settings button. We click on it. We have three bands. Of course, you, you, if you want, you can visualize only one band. But in this case, we're using three bands. So we are calling firstly the near infrared, the red, and the green band. And we apply the new settings. If you want to do it with code, you have it in the uh, slides. Let me pause, put it here again. Okay. So basically, the same what I did here is the code version of it. Let's run. And you see, in the meantime, you can see that actually every time I run, all the layers are loaded. And now let's say in our future processing, we don't want anymore to see this area of interest or let's say the false color. We don't, we are not interested each time to be loaded. So what we can do is to go to the line where we defined uh, map add layer for a particular element. So in this case, let's make it more visible. Uh, in this case, and after defining its name, we can put comma and we can say false. It means that it will not be automatically visualized. We can do this to the false color again. So to the last line, we put false and we run. No, I, we can put zero. For sure, it works with zero. Okay, we change to zero, and you see that our uh, only Lanza 2015 RGB is uh, visualized. Okay, the next part is related to the definition of NDVI. Let's see it also. I am posting firstly just the first option that is actually the implementation of the uh, mathematical expression of the NDVI let's put it also so it can be visible so we want to put this expression into application for that we firstly define our bands separately as a new variables so in this case we define the near infrared which we do by selecting using the Lanza 2015 image, selecting the near infrared uh, band. We do the same with the red band, Lanza 2015 selecting the red band. Then to define the NDVI, 
we basically do exactly this expression. From the uh, near infrared, uh, I'll subtract the red and then divide it by their sum. The final one is that their product will be renamed to NDVI, as we are saying. After that, we are uh, adding it as a new layer. Just this time, we are using uh, different visualization parameters, uh, where the minimum value is minus one and uh, maximum is plus one. And uh, we define that the minus one will actually be blue, the one will be green, and in the middle will gradiently go to uh, one, uh, to white, sorry. So let's run and see it was this one. Okay. Now, actually, our vegetation is even better highlighted. We can see that there is a river passing. Or another option is to actually uh, use, if you think that there is a function that can do what you want to do and you don't need to define everything, you can search for it. In this case, it's called normalized difference for an image. I searched for it in the documentation, I found it, and I can see that uh, the only input is uh, band names, that is a list with the band names. So we do the same exactly. We define the image, we call the function normalized difference, and the arguments are the uh, bands. And again, we are renaming. The result will be absolutely the same. Um, and uh, the last third option is actually we define our own function, but we are using uh, the already done normalized difference function. Why we do that? Because actually this can be applied to the whole collection. Well, this is applying just to an image. When we define the function in this way, we can apply it to the whole collection. So it means to each image in the collection separately. And this will be this approach. The third approach will be the approach that we're going to use in the future. So let's let's print to see that everything is patterned. Given. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, because I didn't add here. Uh, it should be because I didn't add it to the collection. Exactly what I was going to say. So firstly, I have to move the function to the top, as I said to you. And then to actually add the function to the collection. Like this, I do map and DVI LS. It goes like this, yes. And now we run, everything should be in place. So what I did, I took the definition of NDVI uh, LS from Landsat and I put it on top to be already defined. And then I mapped it in the collection of uh, image collection of Landsat 2015 before it became an image. So because if you remember when we called median function, it became an image. Okay, so I think this is it for now. For me, yes, we have actually everything that we will need for the future. We can just, we don't need option one and two, so we can simply uncomment it, comment it out now, and we can continue. Okay, so thank you, Vasil. This part was a bit compressed, but I. I don't want to, I don't know if you want to just to show again the third option that is the one we decided to consider uh, shortly explaining if there is somebody who is uh, late they have the time of uh, of uh, okay. checking again okay so this is what is in the slides uh, okay without this one no uh, no. Let me go and return to the previous situation. So this was not here. And this I'll comment for now. So what you had in the slides is the definition of uh, 
NDVI LS function. LS, we call it like this, this name is given by us. And the input that we want is an image, a single image. We define inside the function what is happening. Basically, we are defining a new variable NDVI that is equal to an image and to which we apply the normalized difference function with calling those two bands. And we rename it to NDVI. The, what the function will return is an image, which will include also this band. So this image, as a result, will go as a new band to the image that we have put as an input. And because now I put it at the end, and this is our layer that we are calling, Plantsan 2015, we're selecting the NDVI band. So if I run it now, it will give me an error. Yes, it is saying that pattern NDVI is not found. It didn't match any bands in Lanza 2015. And this is because for two reasons. Firstly, because the function should be on top. Okay, it is here now. And it's on top because we call it after, we want to call it immediately after that. So in the passage where we're filtering the image collection of Lanza 2015, we want to map this function NDVI LS. So we are applying the function NDVI to each image that we have into the image collection left from here. So in order to work properly, this last function, Lanza 2015 select NDVI, we have to map the function into the image collection and also to be already defined before that. So now if, if I run it, it should work. Exactly. Okay, I hope now it is a bit more clear. Yes, so okay. now I believe that it's very clear. So first of all, we define a function and we needed to put uh, it uh, in the beginning, as we said, because then we want to apply it to this image collection. So in order to it to work and creating also this NDVI band, we want to apply it, to map it to every image of our Lanza collection. And therefore we map it. So we put dot map with the name of the function that we are using in this, uh, in, the, in the image that we are creating or from the collection. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Vasil. Let's you. go ahead because now we have a second satellite to add. Now we have finished what we wanted to do in 2015, as a matter of fact, but we needed to have also 2019. So one possibility is that you repeat exactly the same in the same period of 2019 for Landsat, as I said, that is one possibility. Or another possibility, which is the one that we decided to, um, to adopt for you, just to for, for show you different possibilities, is to consider on the opposite of the Sentinel-2 data. So with respect to Sentinel-2, we, uh, uh, we will select the same period, but in 2019, but we have to do something different because, because the characteristic of the satellite are different. And specifically, if we want to, um, to consider only the um, pixels uh, without cloud, uh, we will do that using this function. That is the same function that we use so when we imported the Sentinel image before. So the, the first exercise that we did that, that was importing the Sentinel image, if you look at the code there, 
uh, in the code there, there is exactly this function helping us in creating a mask where we don't consider the pixels where there are cloud or cirrus. So this is the first point, the, the first difference with respect to Landsat. And this is also something enough standard. So it means that you have to take this piece of code and apply this piece of code to uh, the Sentinel. And then also we want to create the NDVI for Sentinel 2, but the name of the band is different with respect to the case of Landsat. And so we create, we can't reuse simply the uh, uh, function that we created before for Landsat because the name of the band is different. You see uh, in this case is B8, B4. And therefore we create a new, uh, a new uh, function NDVI uh, for Sentinel, but we apply exactly like before to the Sentinel data. So, at this point, what we do is uh, uh, the same that uh, we uh, did with uh, uh, with Landsat uh, with uh, those differences. So you see that here I have to map to this mask that I created before. I'm considering the NDVI, I'm mapping to the function NDVI, even if in this case is the NDVI C, that is the one for Sentinel. And then I'm creating the median, the period is the same, but it is in 2019. I'm considering the same uh, uh, area of interest, uh, and I can see I'm taking in the beginning the um, the um, images only if they have less than ten percent of uh, um, of a percentage of clouds. Okay, then I put this visualization parameter, and I can see the image. Okay, so at this point. Uh, we can visualize also the data for Sentinel, but before considering that, I want just to show you the last slide where the last slide is optional. So we will show you very quickly as a matter of fact, and it is the possibility of visualizing two, uh, two panels, and in one panel, we can see the situation in 2015. In the second panel, we see the situation in 2019. Also, this one is very standard. So simply you can check how it is the code. And then every time you want to change something, you can change it simply by putting the different layer that you are considering. So in this case, we have again Sentinel uh, 2019 and Lanson 2015, and we are comparing them with uh, this uh, uh, screen, uh, with this uh, screen, uh, the, the two screens corresponding to uh, the two uh, years. So uh, I leave you the word, Basil, for the last time, because then we are almost in the end. So I believe that you are very happy because it's a, it's a very tiring workshop. OK, I'm starting. And I'm just continuing on the script that we started before. And uh, let's take the first piece of code that is actually the definition of the functions. So as we said before, let's put them on top somewhere. Uh, paste. Yes, exactly. OK, so those are the two functions, new functions that we have defined. <clears throat> the first one is related to, again, cloud cover and uh, Sentinel-2 images. And it is the one that, uh, yes, we use or, already saw in the Google Earth code suggestion. Uh, the difference here is that actually this one will mask the pixels that will contain clouds. What we were doing till now, and uh, yeah, exactly in this line, is actually we were filtering the image collection. So we were checking 
how much what is the percentage of cloudy pixel in one image and if it's more than 10 percent we didn't consider it in our future uh, analysis but this function will actually take the images that we have left here after this filter and we will check where their clouds and we will remove those pixels so this is what is happening actually here just there is this uh, quality uh, band with uh, related to the clouds and we have uh, for them two bits 10 and 11 that are in charge for the uh, different types of clouds and what we're saying is that we want all the pixels that are equal to zero so those bits are equal to zero which is meaning no clouds at all and to return this mask and to apply it to the image that we have the second function is absolutely the same as uh, what we have defined ndvi for landsat the only difference is that the naming convection of the bands so in this case b8 is the near infrared and b4 is the red uh, band and again the same principle so we can continue and we can take the definition of sentinel 2019 you can see it is almost the same the same uh, we're calling the collection suggested we're defining absolutely the same time frame we're applying again our special boundary with area of interest the only difference here is the naming of the property related to the cloudy uh, pixel this is the only difference but again we're putting it lower than 10 percent we are applying the previously defined uh, functions we're computing the median image and we're clipping according to our area of interest let's put also uh, the rest the visualization parameters and let's add them to the map you can see firstly that okay here we have 18 images in the meantime for the collection of sentinel we have 265 images included so what we see here we see the new ndvi uh, we can reduce the transparency for now on here under it we have actually the rgb image of sentinel 2019 and under it we left landsat 2015 so just by changing the transparency from here you can see that there is some difference between them let's make a quick manual visualization between the ndvis a bit more obvious but instead of doing this layer by layer we can actually do a split screen visualization so let's go to the last slide with code for me it's 56 split screen visualization and paste the code there so what we are doing here we are creating a new linked map and we are adding sentinel 2019 as a layer to it we are centering it again to our object with the same visualization parameters and we are making it linked to our um, main map we are adding a bit titles you see labels and we are defining that actually it's a, sp a split panel so let's see what will happen when we run it, run it. <clears throat> no why it is here let's run again okay now it is on the right correct collect collection okay here we have sentinel 2019 So, okay, here we have one of the images. Okay, you can see we created a split panel between two layers on the left side, which is this left. Oh, oh sorry. We have the image of 2015 Landsat, while on the right side, we have the Sentinel 2019. Okay. 
so we can actually zoom and explore some of the differences between those two periods you can see that each time when we change the zoom level or we move a bit our map it is loading again this is because earth engine is computing on the fly so it means just when it requested at current scale it recomputes again so let's see you can see that there's quite change between the two images okay i think this is it for me for today so thank you Bazi. stay here thank you. so we are at the end in the end of uh, uh, the part one of this uh, webinar uh, the last part, so this part with um, the uh, split of screen is uh, is only optional because it's more complicated. We wanted just to show you how it is possible to have a so nice visualization in such a way that you can compare the situation the two years. So thank you so much uh, to Vasil for helping thank us you. in this uh, webinar. And I want to thank also the students, uh, our assistants, uh, uh, Ahmed, the three Ahmed, Alessandro uh, and uh, Juan Francisco, Giulia, Nicolina, Martina. Thank you so much for helping thank us uh, with the questions, uh, with the answer to the question. Then I want also to uh, thank the people in the backstage, the people of ITU, so Andrea, Andrea Manara, Reinhard Scholl, and Bastian Quast, and Gino. So thank you so much for helping us and organizing this webinar. And again, I want to remember you that we have the second part of the webinar, the 29th of March. And if you have any question, please uh, contact us. Thank you and bye-bye uh, to the next one. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.